Welcome to the World Chaired Practice Forum. My name is Amy Lyons, and I am the director of the Medical Surgical ICU at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, it's my privilege to talk with Dr. Sharon Kinney. Dr. Kinney has a dual appointment as a nursing consultant at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and as a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne. We want to welcome Dr. Kinney to our shared practice forum today. Welcome, Dr. Kinney. Thank you, Amy. Dr. Kinney, why don't you start with telling us how you got to be where you are today? What led you to nursing and then to research? What led me to nursing? I'm not quite sure what led me to nursing, but I can talk about how I got into paediatric nursing, and that wasn't planned at all. Um, I actually fell into paediatrics. I worked, I had a cardiothoracic background. I would trained in adult cardiothoracic work um, in the UK. I'm originally from New Zealand, and when I returned to New Zealand, um, there was a cardiac hospital that I worked at that was adults. And one day someone said, would you like to go and work in the nursery? And I thought, I don't know anything about children, but I'll give it a go. And I loved it. And so I did work there for a number of years. And working in New Zealand, um, there was really no major children's hospitals at that time. And so I moved to Melbourne specifically to do a course, which was in training in paediatric intensive care. And there I could combine my love for cardiac nursing in a unit that also looked after general paediatric intensive care patients. That's fascinating, and you're still there. I'm still associated with that unit. I was only going to be there one year, and I, I worked in that unit for a number of years. And then after that, I, I've had a number of roles, and I was involved in clinical teaching roles. Um, and that was perhaps when I first got interested in research, and nursing research. And um, I would be combining sort of education roles, and I was working at the university, um, teaching our postgrad nurses in the specialty of paediatric intensive care. And so during that time, I, I guess I decided that I needed to spend some more time on research training, and that's what prompted me to undertake my PhD. That's, that's fantastic. Now tell us, tell us a little bit about how you support that bedside nurse in the research. How we support the bedside nurse. Well, I'm fortunate that I do have a dual appointment. So I work in the hospital and I also work at the university. And now I have a real interest in supporting nurses to either use research or to actually conduct research. And coming from the university where I teach evidence-based practice subjects, I know nurses learn these um, skills, but actually in reality in the clinical area, it's much harder to, to carry on and keep engaged with those activities. So I think there's two key activities that we support through our nursing research department at the moment. One is um, our OWL Nursing Journal Club. We call it the OWL Nursing Journal Club. So wisdom coming with the OWL. And um, we tried introducing our nursing journal clubs across the hospital at different times and different places and had various successes. And then we now incorporated in our programs that we call Tuesdays at 2. At 2 p.m. every day, every week, there's an activity on that helps support nurses to either understand research or do research. And so once a month in that program, we have our OWL Nursing Journal Club. And so what we did was we randomised our wards all around the hospital. Initially, we just chose 12 departments because of those 12 months of the year. And we gave guidelines um, how to present at a journal club. We used a simple little article, um, well, it's an article by Schwartz and how to give effective journal club presentations in 10 minutes. We encourage nurses not to use PowerPoints, but to prepare a one-page handout um, according to the guidelines. And uh, we have um, a marking rubric. So we actually mark um, and score each um, uh, journal club. And, and a key aspect of it is to encourage nurses to um, bring other nurses, not just from their ward, but other advanced practice nurses who may be related to. and. Um, the best part about it, I think, is the actual discussion that's generated. I'm sure it's a wonderful discussion. And how do you see the bedside nurses, do they like it? 
Yeah, so in fact, we've evaluated um, the Journal Club and, and we presented back um, at the beginning of this year to the staff just to see if it improved their engagement with research. They certainly did felt, feel they got something out of it. They felt that the um, preparedness to actually present for those who presented, uh, they valued that support. And I think um, one of the difficulties is, is always time to get to these activities. And so uh, we you know, realise that they need support, but, but we have to be fairly time, um, time savvy in doing that. Um, the other thing was our nurses then started to say, hang on, I didn't hear about it. And we realised we had to do some more work with promoting it. So this year we've got 15 departments because people said, hey, I want to be in the journal club competition. Mm. Dr. Kinney, in your research you talk about clinical practice guidelines and how that can support the nurse at the bedside. Can you speak to us a little bit about that today? Yes. Um, another important aspect that we do in our department and is supporting nurses to actually engage and use research and use that to provide direction for their clinical practice. So at our hospital, we've always had um, clinical practice guidelines that have been uh, well utilised around the world and accessible to to all um, from wherever and whatever country. But um, the and nurses' involvement in the development of those guidelines never really happened until recent years. So we have a, on the same website our clinical guidelines that are developed by nurses. They're led, the development is led by nurses, but at the same time, um, we recognise that much of our work, uh, we need multidisciplinary input, so we identify the stakeholders. So what we did um, a couple of years ago, uh, we had great support from our nursing executive director of nursing uh, to try and improve um, development of our clinical guidelines and use of guidelines. So we developed a clinical effectiveness committee and we have nurses fr from all around the hospital. We actually have about 47 nurses on this committee and at our monthly meetings we'd probably have at least 20 nurses and they come from all departments and we have different levels of experience. And the first step was to set up formal processes and how we were going to identify the need for a guideline, uh, processes of review, templates for, for preparation. And also we wanted to, nurses to uh, be encouraged to look at the evidence to inform the guidelines. So we do have a hierarchy of evidence and an um, evidence table that they are asked to complete. Perhaps not surprising is that for many things that we do in our nursing practice, there isn't actually the levels of evidence of research to support. But expert opinion is also um, valued, and so this is where the committee comes in. So to date, we've published 66 nursing clinical guidelines. We track um, the hits and we average about 60,000 hits per month, and last month we had 80,000 hits. Our most popular clinical guideline was oxygen delivery and how we deliver oxygen to children. And I had a quick look before I came and I noticed uh, most of those hits, about 50% are from Australia, but 25% were from the United States. So our guidelines are, are widely utilised and uh, we're, we're certainly wishing to grow those guidelines as well. That's just wonderful work. Mm, thank you. Mm. I'd like to turn to our audience now and pose a question. When you answer, if you could please state the hospital location where you work. In your hospital, do you develop clinical nursing guidelines in your unit? And if so, is it a multidisciplinary team who develops these guidelines? If you don't develop clinical practice guidelines in your unit, where do you get your clinical practice guidelines from if you use any? Dr. Kinney, your research is about patient safety and you share a passion for that patient safety. Can you tell us how you share that passion with the nurses at the bedside? Um, yes, my, my interest in patient safety first arose from being involved in implementing what we call our medical emergency teams, um, also known as rapid response teams to, to many around the world. And I had the opportunity to be involved in, in implementing, in fact, one of the first paediatric medical emergency teams um, with colleagues at our hospital, Dr. Jim Tibbles particularly. We um, in, implemented the system back in 2004. And uh, th this was a great op opportunity to be involved in the 
hospital uh, more widely, I think, and appreciating coming from a critical, area, critical care area, I'd always had uh, interest in resuscitation, both teaching and research. Um, I became much more aware, though also in the hospital, how difficult it is for um, nurses in the ward environments sometimes to have access to um, the sort of help they need, uh, sometimes having difficulties identifying the children when they're sick, um, sometimes children were being cared for in wards that perhaps weren't the ideal ward for that um, level of expertise. And Dr Tibbles, who, who led this implementation, we were informed um, in Australia, they'd implemented the medical emergency teams um, in the 1990s. And they were the first in the world, actually, to implement these systems. And we were quite impressed with their results. And so there was a lot of discussion at the hospital, could we do this in paediatrics? So there was a multidisciplinary committee that was formed. And we um, particularly adopted the principles of getting um, help to the bedside uh, 24 hours a day that the uh, responders would go um, straight away. And no call was a bad call. That was really important, that nurses or medical staff um, could call at any time. And then we quickly realised that parents actually um, also could identify when their children weren't uh, going so well or when their condition was deteriorating. So our first criteria of was initially staff member concerned that very quickly changed to staff member or parent concerned. And then we, um, we sort of, the criteria around changes in heart rate, respiratory rate, resp um, saturation and, and blood pressure, we modified uh, where applicable, for example, the heart rate and the respiratory rate age related values to guide clinicians when they could call for our medical emergency team met. That's, that's yes. wonderful. Now, you said that you started with the clinicians and then you went to the parents. With the parents, did you find any hesitation for them to call from the parent yes. side? When we first um, changed the criteria to have um, parent add, parent concern, we didn't actually go out and teach the parents how to uh, initiate the MET system. It was really more about when what we would do, um, we would collect data of all our MET calls, we would present back um, monthly initially instructive cases and what was highlighted very early on was that many children who are in hospital for a period of time have quite complex conditions, chronic illnesses and sometimes events were being missed and and perhaps being dismissed a little bit by staff. And it became apparent that what we all know in paediatrics, parents particularly know their, the baseline of their right. children. And so we wanted to really encourage um, our staff to listen to the parents. And so that was where we sort of left it more, just listen to what the families are telling us. But a couple of years ago, um, we also have implemented uh, family or parent initiated met. And um, like most places around the world, in reality, there's not that many calls that are initiated by the family, but I suspect many more have been influenced by the family speaking to the bedside nurse who might that's, make that decision. Mm. That's just wonderful work. Now, did you feel any pushback from the nurses about the family initiated call? It might in part be to the way it was implemented because I think it was sort of happened fairly quickly. Um, I, I know from looking at the literature around this topic though, um, certainly that, you know, attitudes and concerns, more so amongst physicians and medical staff actually, that um, parents will be um, perhaps overcalling the system or perhaps parents and um, it might um, undermine the relationship the, the primary physician that has with, with that family. But just from being aware of the literature, that doesn't seem to be the case and, and uh, that hasn't happened. But so there were concerns, but certainly um, when it was rolled out, it was certainly discussed at wider forums and, and that was really important. And I, I think the spin off it has been is, it, it's another aspect of family-centred care where we're trying to um, encourage, you know, engagement with our families and, and listen to our families. And um, I, I think in the end, that's what's really important. Wonderful work. Thank you. Now we'll turn to the audience and ask you if you have a medical emergency response teams in your hospital, 
When you answer the question, please state the location of your hospital. Dr. Kitty, please share with us your work about the observation charts that you've implemented. Yes, Amy, thank you. Um, currently, I'm involved in a project where we're trying to standardize our pediatric observation and, and response charts. And what I mean by this, um, most hospitals in Australia, we still have paper-based charts. Um, I recognise some will have electronic charts, but we have uh, paper-based charts. And there's been a lot of work in our country, and it's partly being driven by our national standards from the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Um, and there's one standard called National Standard 9 called Recognising and Responding to Patient Deterioration. And already around Australia and some of our other states, the states have actually implemented a, a statewide approach to recording observations, both on and adults and children, and they've implemented this approach in each of the states. In Victoria, which is the state that I live in, um, we don't have the same centralised process to, to implement these types of um, initiatives. And so it, Many hospitals have implemented their own observation chart where they've tried to uh, use a chart where, in the best way, you can help clinicians identify when the child's deteriorating. And these are colored coded charts. And some of these charts are called track and trigger tools or um, early warning scores where you actually add up numbers. But we've chosen uh, what we'd call the track and trigger tool and it's perhaps most famously known in our country in New South Wales, they call it between the flags, keeping children safe and keeping them between the flags. And they use this life-saving analogy of swimming between the flags. And the flags on the observation chart, there's different colour zones to sort of warn you when perhaps you should seek medical help or when you should seek for emergency response. So in our hospital, We'd always had our MET criteria that I spoke about before, the age-related values. And so one of the things we did a few years ago was actually integrate those criteria onto our observation charts. And as you know, um, children of different ages have different values of heart rate and respiratory rate. So we developed a set of five charts, five age groups, less than three months, uh, three to 12 months, one to four years, five to 11, and then greater than 12. And within those charts, we'd color coded initially just with one color, a blue color, as a guidance for when clinicians should call the MET, the medical emergency team. What we've been doing though in the last year is actually um, we've chosen, there's a, a time perhaps when we've actually decided it needs to be mandated rather than leaving it in the hands of the clinicians because unfortunately what happens is for the majority of the time, clinicians can um, pick it up earlier, but there are always those occasions in retrospect where people realised we could have picked up earlier. So we now have um, two colours on our chart. And one of the problems having all these different age-related values with children is they change so much depending on their age. But many of the... Um, scores, the early warning scores, or the charts that have been used around the world, most of us, most of them have been informed by what are normal values of, in uh, children in the community, mm -hmm. their heart rates and respiratory rate. And so I was actually, two years ago, I was fortunate to be on a study tour um, looking at this topic, and I went to Children's Hospital Philadelphia and met up with Dr. Chris Bonafide, and he um, shared some data with me that he's since published. And he and his colleagues um, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, they collected something like, I think from about 14,000 children, of heart rate and respiratory rate values. And from that, they developed percentile charts of what would be considered the normal sort of um, 50th percentile. And we use that data, the 95th percentiles and the 99th percentiles to inform our charts. So for the upper values and the first and the fifth percentiles to form the lower values. So for example, a child's uh, respiratory rate, um, the upper rate for that child, the 95th percent value would be orange um, and from the 95th to the 99th percentile, the chart's colour coded orange. And that's the zone that um, directs clinicians to say, hey, 
We think you probably need to get a clinical review from the medical staff within 30 minutes. We also advise them about some extra monitoring and things like that. And then if the child hits the 99th percentile at the upper um, respiratory rate extreme, or say the first percentile, which would be the very low respiratory mm -hmm. rate, that's um, a trigger for our emergency response and they're required to call a medical emergency team that would respond straight away. So that, that sort of principle we're trialling in two wards in our hospital, but we also um, were fortunate to get some funding from our Department of Health in the state of Victoria. And we're trialling these charts in 10 different um, clinical sites around the state. And some of these are, are, are bigger teaching hospitals, some are more rural and regional hospitals. One of our hospitals, um, children are cared for in an adult environment and the level of medical support is a general practitioner who won't be there on site all the time. So we're trialling to see um, more about the usability of the charts at the moment. Mm. And have folks to date found them usable? Yes, um, we're just in the middle of our evaluation now and we're doing various chart audits, but also we're having focus groups with nursing and medical staff at the, the various sites. And, Overall, um, people have embraced the charts really well. Um, many hospitals didn't have any sort of um, track and trigger chart, and so they were pleased to, to, to be in the trial. In fact, when we first set up um, the statewide paediatric observation and response chart project, um, we had 22 sites wanting to be part of our trial. So there's a real need for it, and partly it's our national standards that has driven that. So I guess the time was right for us. Um, but certainly the preliminary feedback, we've got good feedback about how we can modify the charts a little bit, and we're implementing in um, most of our hospitals in Victoria. That's wonderful. And in your yeah. hospital, have you seen a decrease in cardiac arrest? since the charts. Yes. It's a little bit early to say just with the implementation of these charts. Certainly our MET system, um, uh, one of the studies I was involved in with Dr. Tibbles was our four-year outcomes of looking at the introduction of MET. And one of the difficulties when you're looking at decreased cardiac arrests, they don't actually occur very often in the ward environments. And so it's a very hard measure to yes. show a, a reduction. But what we did show was a reduction in what we had called preventable card cardiac arrests. And these were children who had a cardiac arrest and retrospectively when we looked at their observation charts during the previous six hours, they had some signs that would have transgressed what was then our MET criteria. And we did significantly reduce those. And we did, um, the MET system did seem to have an impact on hospital mortality and significantly reducing that. But I would have to caution, um, as, as exciting as that sort of sounds, um, it was a before and after study. And there certainly could have been many other things that were happening in the hospital to improve mm -hmm. those outcomes. But we do think the MET system um, actually helped reduce that mortality. Um, but this only mandating MET and introducing these charts, is, is, it's too early, it's fairly recent, that introduction. That's but that's something to, you know, obviously measure. Yes. Absolutely, that's wonderful work. Yes, thank you. Now let's turn to our audience, and the question posed to the audience is, do you have some type of early warning recognition system in your unit? And when you answer, if you could please state where your hospital is located. I want to say thank you to our audience and a special thanks to Dr. Sharon Kinney for sharing her wonderful work with us today. And I look forward to speaking to her in the future. Thank you, Amy. And it was, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this forum. You're quite welcome.